the greatest image for me is Christ. You and I are carrying a lighter burden because of him. He says, take my yoke upon you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But bring that to me. Come to me, all you who are tired and heavy laden. Bring that to me. That's Christ and Christ-likeness looks like that. Saying that I can choose without coercion and without anyone telling me, I can voluntarily choose to live with a little less so the child can live with a little more. When we ask, what does crisis look like? If a child came to you and pulled on your shirt or your trousers and your dress and said, what does Christ-likeness look like? Christlessness looks sacrificial. But there is great joy in that. Pastor Richmond, he is the senior pastor of New Life Baptist Church um, in Kampala. And in addition to that, he founded a wonderful ministry that is really uh, partnering with local pastors and discipling them and, and training them, equipping them. And so it does a wonderful work uh, over in that part of the world. But it's a great honour and joy to be hosting him. You'll hear a little bit more about his story this morning. But uh, his childhood was marked with poverty and loss. And um, at eight years old, through his local church, uh, he was a part of the Compassion Child Sponsorship Program and uh, absolutely changed and transformed his life and his family. And it's just a, a wonderful story of the difference that Jesus can make in a person's life. And of course, today is Compassion Sunday and uh, you'll hear a little bit more about how we can partner with Compassion at the end of the service. But so looking forward to hearing you uh, in our 8 a.m. and again in our 10, looking forward to tonight. So while we're on our feet, can we put our hands together and really honour Pastor Richmond as he comes to platform today. We bring honor and glory to Jesus. He deserves the praise. Heavenly Father, we honor you and we glorify your holy name. All across this room, oh God, I pray that you resurrect dreams, that you raise up ministries, that you make manifest that which you put on the inside of us. And a person who walked from home or came from home or drove from home in a place that is difficult, they're carrying a weight, struggling, the same way you lifted my weight, the same way you brought light when I was in great darkness, the same way you broke the chains that were shackled around me. I pray that that will happen today, that people will step into a place of freedom, that they might know you, O oh God, and the power of your resurrection. Lord, move, I pray. Move, I pray. Move, I pray. In Jesus' name. Somebody lift your hands and give God the glory and the praise in this house. Hallelujah to the risen King. Praise the Lord. Why don't you take your seats for a moment as I say a special thank you to Pastor Renee and uh, a very special happy birthday. Uh, to uh, Pastor Martin here. Thank you so much and all the great work that you do uh, with the colleges here. I'd like to want to say a massive welcome to all those who are joining us online and to those that are situated in various campuses. I want to acknowledge the Brisbane campus, the Cairns campus, the Emerald campus, the Rockhampton campus, the Yupon campus, Sunshine Coast and Calvary Online. Just can we give them a special welcome, each one of you, wherever you are. Thank you. God is moving in this church and through this community. When I was hearing how many churches are being planted, I'm hearing how God is working. It's like, what a joy and a privilege it is for me to be among you, to witness the work and the move of God. Earlier on today, we sang this incredible song that this Jesus, His name is indeed Jesus. His name is Jesus. And I was transported over to a verse that really centered my life and gave me the deepest confidence that I have now. And this verse is found in the book of Colossians chapter 1. And Paul is writing to the church of Colossae. And he's talking about Jesus and he's saying that, that this, he's the Son, his, that the Son is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For in Him all things were created. Things in heaven and things on earth. Things visible and things invisible. Whether thrones or powers, 
or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood that was shed on the cross. This Jesus, this Jesus is why when I come to you today, even though my country is thousands of kilometers from here, I can say brother and I can say sister. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. That's the name. That's the name. That's the God. That's who is the reason we are here. I'm excited to exalt Jesus before you today. Not just in my story, but in my nation's story. Nations like individuals go through ups and downs and you know what that means. You have had seasons of highs in your life and seasons of lows. Seasons when you feel like God is so close and everything is working out. And seasons when you feel like God it feels like I'm crying out to you from a dry place. Where are you? I can't feel you. My enemies are laughing at me. That was true for my nation as well. See, in the 1877, the gospel finally reached a nation in East Africa, a nation of about 48 million people, a nation that was surrounded by other nations, a landlocked country called Uganda. And about the time, many people came to know the Lord. By the time the 1930s and 1940s came along, Uganda was majority a Christian nation. We were experiencing the highs in God. But then this 1970s came and uh, new president stepped on the scene and his name was Idi Amin. And he ruled the nation for nine long years. Many people thought it was the end of the world. He persecuted the church. People fled out of Uganda. And a nation that was in 40% 40 Christian came down to less than 10%. One leader, driven by one ugly mission, was changing our nation. But a few years later, here we are in 2024. And it brings me great joy to announce to you that 84% of my nation's population are calling on the name of the Lord. Jesus said that I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And the same story of the nation of Uganda where we are seeing hope and light enter a space of great darkness is a story that's similar to yours and mine. If you're living in great darkness right now and you're carrying a weight and maybe you walked into this church feeling, maybe I should come this morning or maybe I shouldn't. I want you to know that there is always hope. There is always hope. There is always hope. Just two Saturdays ago, we had, as a church in Uganda, baptized 29 people who had come to know the Lord. 29 souls were baptized and rose up to a new life in Jesus. Coming here, I thought, you know, it's about 21 hours of a flight to this place. So that gives you a lot of time to think. And I was thinking, how do I communicate to Calvary what is happening in Uganda? What God is doing in our region? And then it hit me that while we may not have the stadiums that you have, but those stadiums that you have paint an incredible picture. You have one of the largest football stadiums, or it's a rugby stadium. I don't know what it is here, but it's, it has the word bank in it. And I thought, the word bank in a stadium... But I extended that thought to consider what's the capacity of the stadium. And I was told 25,000. Can you 
you imagine 25,000 people in one place? But then I thought to myself, look, what just happened in East Africa, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda? We didn't have just 25,000. When you multiply 25,000 by four, you were at 100,000, but that's not it. Get that 100,000, multiply it by four again, you were at 400,000. So if you can possibly imagine 400,000 children and the generation that that represents, walk with me. Today is Sunday, yesterday was Saturday. Yesterday, 400,000 children across East Africa were running with joy across their community to a compassion project. To hear about Jesus and to receive the support they need. A generation is rising. And inheritance is being given to countries like Uganda. Uh, people that will rise up to know their God and to give their lives for Him. And to go boldly into their future. And the church in Uganda wouldn't have done this by itself. Did you know that Calvary, as we speak now, has come alongside 750 children and their families and releasing them out of poverty, not just releasing them from poverty, but doing so in Jesus' name. A generation is rising. There's a legacy that's being built right now as we speak. And so the old words of Jesus in the book of John chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, my father is always working. And so today I get to reflect with you on how that is true for my country. We're seeing bold visions being given. And some of you might have already heard this. That yes, there are 330 million children in extreme poverty around the world. But about 2.2 million of those are already connected to hope through compassion. And a new vision just got cast out early this year that compassion is set between now and 2028, the goal is to reach the next 1 million children. And not just release them from poverty, but release them from poverty in the mighty name, in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And many of you today are already part of this movement. And so let me pause and say, Asante Sana. Thank you. From the depth of my heart, thank you. For those of you who are helping a child who cannot speak for themselves, that child who feels voiceless, you are being their voice. For those kids who cannot fight for themselves, you are fighting for them. Nothing, nothing is so relieving and hope-giving as a child who is standing there in trepidation, looking at the strong man who has come to steal their future and steal their hope. And someone stands between this child and the strong man. So to get to this child, you've got to go through me. Listen, that's what Jesus did for you and did for me. Death had surrounded us. Sin was sinking us down. But he came and stood. And mercy said no. Mercy said no to all the condemnation and the guilt that was heading our way. We were carrying that weight. And Jesus said, hey, between this child will stand myself on that cross at Calvary. And you and I can be here today celebrating God and praise God. Tonight we gather to consider this impact, the impact of the church, what Jesus is doing around the world. And I want to take a moment to share with you my story as we reflect on this idea of being agents of hope, being the light in troubled times. How many of you observing the world know that we're living in troubled times? Yes, we're living in troubled times, but I said there is always hope. Wes Stafford put it very well when he said, this world is troubled, but God has a plan. And the church is God's plan A. And there is no plan B. There is no plan B. You are it. I am it. And God has put behind us everything we need. We, you and I have everything we need to do for God what he expects us to do today. And so... I'm excited that I'm speaking to agents of possibility. The reason I say you're agents of possibility is because I'm already seeing what's happening to the 750 souls, lives, families that have already experienced a new life. Their life is currently different 
because of you. And so I want to say thank you. I want to begin by showing you a picture, a picture of me standing in Naguru Slum. <laughs> Naguru Slum was and continues to be my home community. I wasn't born in Naguru. Something happened to my family that brought us to Naguru Slum. I was only eight years old when the unthinkable happened to my family. At the age of eight, my father was murdered. And he was murdered in the presence of my mom. And one day, it seemed like I had lost both my parents. My father was gone physically. But my mom, she was never the same. See, before my father's passing, my mom was the kind of woman you called when you're having a bad day, she could encourage, she, she could talk your ear off. But after my father's passing, to draw one word out of my mom was difficult. We as kids saw as our mom changed. See, when my father fell, blooded, she fell as well. Something happened to her heart. Her health just began to deteriorate from that time on. And we as kids just saw our mom just in bed, lying in bed, unable to get up. And then everything closed out for us. I remember when the landlord came and knocked our door and said we could no longer live in the house we lived in, the house we've always known. That's when my mom announced that we have to go. And then in the midst of that deep crisis, there was this relative of ours who had financial problems. And he comes and asserts something that my mom disagreed with, but she had no voice and she had no power. The man asserted that some of the items my father had purchased were purchased with money borrowed from him. My mom rejected that. Said, I, Stephen never shared with me anything like that. And, but this man had all the power. So took the few things that we had. So there we were being kicked out of a house, and that was the, probably the longest journey I've ever taken. It was about two kilometers of a walk, but I tell you, it felt like a hundred kilometers. We finally arrived in this slum called Naguru. And when we arrived at this one-roomed house that my mom had found, picture with me a 12 by 12 feet room. Six children and a mother. During the day, we would have our stools in the center of the house. But in the night, we would push our stools to the side and we just lay one next to another. My mom had an African dress called the Busuti. Uh, it's, very, very, it's a very nice dress. But what we did is we would lay down and in part of her clothes and then we would cover with part of her, her clothes. We were desperate for hope. And then... We got the big announcement from my mom that she had run out of everything she had. There was no more money for food. So what began as visits to the street for me became a lifestyle. We would just wake up and go. And then I was told I could no longer attend school. Most of you don't know this, but in Uganda, it's private education. If you have a parent that can afford for you to go to school, <laughs> good on you. Please go, go, dream, go to school, study, do the subjects you love to do. Dream. But if you don't have a parent or somebody to stand with you, no matter how much you love school, the door is closed. And so that became my life. I used to walk with my closest sibling. Her name was Doreen. She was six at the time. We used to walk on the street together. And so many things happened to us on the street. I remember one day running after a moving banana truck just because a few moments ago I saw my sister failing. I had left her to sit under a shade, under one of the large trees in Nakawa. And I ran after a moving truck and I literally climbed the back bed of a banana truck. Moving truck. Plucked bananas off this truck, jumped back down and came back to my sister. And then I remember another day when it was about 2 a.m. in the morning and the rain started. See, I... I've been in Australia just a few days and I'll be going back to Uganda soon. But I met a gentleman who said, ah, man, I, I love the rain. And I looked at him and knew 
we're standing in a different place here. Because in Uganda, when it rained, particularly in Nagur Islam, that was the time when parents held their children very close because mosquitoes love stagnant water. They breed in thousands. That's when malaria becomes a real problem. That's when cholera becomes a real problem. And so this particular day, it's not just the fear of malaria or the fear of cholera, but this particular day, it's 2 a.m. in the morning and the rain has started. We think it's normal rain. It's not because it's come with strong torrent and strong wind. Naguru Islam didn't have electricity. In the night, it's pitch black. When it rains, you can just hear these, these tin roofs as they bend to the force of the wind. And there's that sound. It's just very scary for children. But for us, it was going to get a worse night because the center iron sheet of our house ended up being blown off by the wind. The amount of water that filled our home that day is beyond description. We just stood on the side as we watched water rise in our home. I lost something that day. I don't have an English word for it. It might be dignity or self-image or self-concept. I don't know what word that is. But I just felt I was nothing. In the midst of this desperation, we didn't know this at the time, but God was with us. He was watching over us. And my mom, my mom, she makes her way to one of her friends and says, look, someone's got to help me. Someone's got to help me. And so her friend told her about a church across the community that was sponsoring kids. Long story short, my mom ends up going to this church and the rest is history. I remember standing there. And there's a gentleman called David who worked for Compassion. He had this big camera and he was taking my photo. And I wanted my photo to be taken. I remember standing there and, you know, some of you, I, mean, I don't know if you can see it from a distance, but this pause is perfect. Because I was looking at this, this boy is called Baraka. Baraka means blessing. And you can imagine what's going on in the mind and the heart of Baraka's mother when she's naming him Blessing. And that was exactly my pause. And I remember standing there for that pause like that. And then I started pausing differently. In fact, my sponsor later on said the part of the reason she picked my, my photo was my pause. <laughs> and uh, so there I was. And every time that flash went off, it felt like hope was on its way. And sure enough, three months later, three months later, my family got the news that would send us dancing and rejoicing. I'm standing at a distance and my mom is there and now talking with David. And as my mom is talking to David, she throws down the broom she was using to sweep and she just goes off. <laughs> now, as I see her turning, now, oh, let me explain this for a moment. So I come from the Bagisa tribe and the Bagisa tribe is one of 56 tribes in Uganda. Other tribes are known for jumping such uh, heights. Other tribes are known for their expression culturally, but for us, we are known for shoulder shaking. And so when the drums start, we just go off and it's the most beautiful sight. And then the women come in the midst of that celebration and they'll go, ah, li, 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 li. I, I don't have quite the voice for that. But if you hear it, it is the loudest, most impressive sound. So I'm standing at a distance and my mom is just going around. Ah, li, 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 li. And I knew that's good news. I remember running off to my mom and my mom says, Richmond, you found a sponsor. I knew in the moment that my life had changed. Now, dancing became mine. It was my turn to dance. Long story short, we ended up going to the church. It was my first time in a church. We were not a believing family, but entering a church, I was just here looking around, and then came a man. His name was Peter. He was the senior pastor of the church. Loved the community. And Peter tells me what it means to be sponsored. One, that I would be able to immediately access a mosquito net. Two, I was told I could go to school. And then he gives me my health number, UG129 forward slash 0064. I could never forget that number. He said to me, Richmond, anytime you fall sick, you feel malaria, a fever, don't run to church. Don't even run to anyone at Compassion. Run to any hospital around the community. They are all supplied with a list of sponsored children. 
Whatever you're going through, they will treat you. And here's the thing. Don't worry about the bill. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. My life was changing. Everything was changing. And then a few months later, my sister Doreen, you remember that six-year-old girl on the street with me? She also found a sponsor from Australia, Don and Julie Thompson. We will never forget those names because we prayed and thanked God for their gift. Well, a few years in, uh, I'm now writing to my new sponsor and we're exchanging and it's changing my life. And my mom gets to learn who my sponsor was. You would never believe this. My sponsor, Heather, Listen, was a 15-year-old girl. My family has never understood that. What kind of maturity would be given to a 15-year-old to join the fight? To live with less so I could live with more. To live simply so I could simply live. My mom said, this would very easily be my daughter. And yet how one act was changing our world. It wasn't long after that. By this time, I have attended the program so many times. I began to hear about the gospel, strange message, but a good message. And then I was now 14 years old. And Pastor Peter, he comes and preaches from Genesis 39 and 40. I will never forget this message. And he's talking about the young boy, Joseph. And Joseph Hawk was going through all this pain and suffering. And he'd done nothing wrong. But there was a God who had a good plan for him. And as I heard these words, and there was a warming in my spirit, I knew that this God was present with us that day. And at the age of 14, I gave my life to Christ. And by the time I was 16 years old, All five of my siblings had given their lives to Christ. Christ was changing our home. This is how God is moving. In the places where there's great darkness, there is a light that is coming. And it started in our home in such a powerful way. And by the time I was 19 years old, my mother, my mother gave her life to Jesus. When I was 19. And by the time I was 24 years old, Pastor Peter, who had become the father that I did not have, he had seen as I had grown in the world and he brought me under his wing and he began to nurture and help me out. And I was announced as his associate pastor. And today, I have no better way to say this, but I'm currently the lead pastor of the very church that I walked into as an eight-year-old boy without hope. Jesus said, my father is always working. And for every yes to Christ, change happens. His kingdom comes to the glory of the father. I mentioned that I'm the senior pastor today of the very church that I was joined as a Compassion kid, but I want to tell you another story. So growing up in a guru slum, we were neighbored by a family. And in this family, there was a young boy called Arthur. Arthur's parents ended up passing away because of HIV AIDS. And Arthur is now by himself. My mother comes out of the house and finds that Arthur is sitting and there's a big padlock on the door that Arthur has known as home for a long time. And uh, my mom walks to him and asks, and how's the conversation with Arthur? Remember, we're in a 12 by 12 roomed house. There's six of us and my mom. When Arthur describes the situation, my mom, Antonina, that's her name, she looks at Arthur and says, there is always room. Come, you are my son from today on. Many of us have not been exposed to the generosity among the poor. 
But God is at work. I remember as kids watching Arthur standing at the door, coming in, and we're like, where is room? There's no room. And it's not just room of where to lay your body. It's a question of food as well. And uh, long story short, I mentioned that I'm the lead pastor of this church, that I was plugged in as a young child without hope. I want you to guess who my associate pastor is. (laughs) Arthur. (laughs) You know, I always fix my mind on the opportunities that are before us every day. To cast seeds into a legacy that God would have us build, not for ourselves, to go against culture. Because culture says you are number one in your life. Everything must focus on you. Everything must be about you. You find someone and they have eight pairs of shoes or ten pairs of shoes. Like all that is for you. (laughs) And 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 I, I talk to people and I'm like, wow. Wow. All those cups of coffee a day for you. Wow. Hey, you know. But every time, you know, I've I've just been here a few days, but I've I've noticed something. Uh, There was a person who was crossing the street. And I know that you trust your traffic lights very much. But this person is crossing the street on their phone looking down. In Uganda, that's a death sentence. I mean, you're gone. But, But another thought crossed my mind. And I thought, Man, there's a lot of people walking through life looking down. I wonder what they'll see if they could only look up. God wants to show us so much if we can only look up. And society is saying, no, focus on yourself, fix on yourself. It's about you, but God wants us to have a kingdom vision, a worldview, to see his world as he sees it. I have a picture of my graduation day. I don't know if that could come up here, but I, I've, I remember being on the day of graduation. Yes, if you look right in the middle there. I don't know how else to put it, but let me put it this way. That this child that was on the street, stripped of hope. As you can imagine, on the street, ho- there is no hope on the horizon. But because of one act of a 15-year-old, this boy stands before you today with a bachelor's degree in accounting. You know, I have considered the following, and I want to summarize what I'm saying to you in just a few thoughts here. And I'll tell you one of my favorite stories in the scriptures here shortly. But I've thought about my own life, and I see that with all the cries in poverty, we can draw from this story the idea that every cry of a child in poverty is a call to action for the church. I mentioned that the church is God's plan A and there is no plan B. I also want to see here that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. These are the words that Jesus coined in the book of 1 John, chapter 3 and verses 17. He says, this is how we know what love is. Christ Jesus laid down his life for us. And therefore, we ought to lay our lives down for our brothers and sisters. This is the calling. That in trying to find ourselves for our own benefit, we lose ourselves. But when we lose ourselves in the service of others, we find ourselves. And I believe that in the service of others, in the love of others, is when we are most fully alive. And I know from the story of All of the children that I know that have come through victory against poverty, that it takes courage. It takes courage to live counterculturally. It takes courage to step out of line from society and say, I want to step into the line following Jesus. It takes courage because every one of us wants to live almost in a way as society would have us live. But Christ is calling us to consider fruit like what you just saw. I remember what Charles Dickens says, something that has really stuck with me. 
It says, no one is useless in this world who lightens up the burdens of another. The greatest image for me is Christ. You and I are carrying a lighter burden because of him. He says, take my yoke upon you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But bring that to me. Come to me, all you who are tired and heavy laden. Bring that to me. That's Christ and Christ-likeness looks like that. Saying that I can choose without coercion and without anyone telling me, I can voluntarily choose to live with a little less so the child can live with a little more. When we ask, what does crisis look like? If a child came to you and pulled on your shirt or your trousers and your dress and said, what does Christ-likeness look like? Christlessness looks sacrificial. But there is great joy in that. I came here to thank you for standing up for the vulnerable. I came here to thank you for being a voice for the voiceless. I came here to thank you for fighting for those who cannot fight for themselves. There's another picture I have, a picture of myself as a kid. I was a kid and it contrasts me as a child on the street and me today. Um, Not only am I the pastor of New Life Church in Uganda, but God opened a unique door for me to do a master's degree in spiritual formation and discipleship. And for two long years, I focused on the idea and the question, how do you actually disciple a nation? Because I was burdened for my country, seeing so many people come to Christ, but many of them remaining in the shallow place. And I was like, how do you disciple a nation? When I graduated, it just dawned on me that I was now in the top 1% of pastors across Africa that have this level of training. It was clear to me that to whom much is given. And so I established a platform. It's called the Pastors Discipleship Network. A platform on my, that time my focus was on Uganda. Well, a few years in, the Lord has expanded that platform to five African nations. As of March of this year, we had reached 15,533 pastors who are stronger in their mission and bolder in their work for the Lord. And I cannot help. And every time I'm standing before these pastors, whether it is in Uganda or Kenya or Tanzania or Rwanda, we're now going into Zimbabwe. Listen, whenever I stand and consider, I always want to remember where it all started. All this potential was dying and fading out on the street. Until one person, one child of God, considered making one act to lighten the Lord for just one child. She had no idea. And I think you and I have no idea. The 750 children that are sponsored by Calvary, we have no idea what God has in stock. But God foresees. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the needs of the coming times for these nations. Like in Uganda, he knew there was going to be a time when pastors are going to be struggling with shallowness. Pastors who feel ill-equipped to serve. And he knew that within one of these children was destiny to bring hope to many of these struggling pastors. And it would take one person to make that decision. Your investment in a child's life today is a thread in God's grand story of hope. We are part of a bigger story. I want to share with you where we are today as a family. I put up a picture of my siblings and where we are. We made it. All five of my siblings made it. To the left is my brother Richard. He plays football. Next to him is my sister Sharon. She's in hospitality. She loves people. She loves to serve. Next to her is my brother Raphael. His dream is to be an accountant. He's currently into the practice of bookkeeping, but he's getting there. Next to him is my brother Ronald. From his size, you can guess. He plays rugby. (laughs) 
they pay him for hitting people and he's constantly breaking this and breaking that but he goes back to the field. Next to him is myself. I'm a pastor today. And do you remember that six-year-old girl, Doreen? That's the one to the extreme left for you or right for you. Doreen is a social worker today. She spends her time on the street rescuing girls who are being abused and trafficked. Her favorite flower is the looping flower. She sees girls as flowers. So she's established a work called Lupins. She's brought in over 63 girls now. And she's protecting them. And all of this is because someone said yes. You know, I was looking at Baraka today. And I was at the table and I said, God, just the weight that Baraka is carrying. His birthday is 17th of March, 2018. You read his story at the back. It just messes with you. How can a kid so young? And then there's another young man. His name is Emmanuel. Emmanuel was born on the 15th of March as well, 2020. Emmanuel lives in Kenya. And I'm so delighted that this church will be going to Kenya next year. Yeah, you're going to Kenya next year, so you have a chance. Those of you who are going to sponsor these children today, you have a chance for standing face to face with these children. And so, if you might ask me, Richmond, what did you come to say to us? This is what I would say. That God is working. He's already gone ahead of you. He's established local churches in these communities and is inviting you to join him in his work. But that might look, first of all, by you deciding, am I willing to follow him into this space? And it requires sacrifice. It's not easy to sponsor a child. That's over $55 a month. But some of you consider and say, look, that's almost $1.80 a day. If I, if I skip or coffee or whatever, that could change a child and release potential. And I'm asking you to consider that very seriously. Heather did that for me. She took a babysitting job a few hours in the week so she could take care of me. She told me that where there is a will, there is a way. And he gives us wisdom, God does, to step into that space of faith. It is Calvary's dream that we'll move from 750 to 1,000 children sponsored. How many of you believe that's possible? Amen. Amen and amen. In a few days, I'll be going and meeting these children's parents, and I will be the one announcing to many of their parents that your child has found hope. Give me the joy to do that. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness, kindness, and love. Today, Lord, we come before you, thanking you for Calvary. Thanking you for the mission of this church. Thanking you for the global footprint for this church around the world. For all the church plants that we are seeing. All the people that are finding hope. Those who are receiving healing and a touch of God. Thank you. And Lord, for the many children across this nation who are finding hope in you. Thank you. May you be glorified as your church moves forward in strength. As your church sacrifices to the glory of your name to see mothers and babies dance and rejoice for hope. May that glory return to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Calvary.